Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. We all have set images of what it's like being a woman in the Arab world. Covered up, cloistered, denied access to education or paid work, married off at a young age, and subject to brutal punishment for any violation of their society's strict social rules. But as journalist Catherine Zoff discovered during her years of reporting from the Arab world, the stories of the young women who live there are far more nuanced, while the increasingly global economy is changing their lives in significant, if not quite revolutionary, ways. Her illuminating book, Excellent Daughters, The Secret Lives of the Young Women Who Are Transforming the Arab World, has just been published by the Penguin Press imprint of Random House. And the stories she tells about the young women she came to know are moving, eye-opening, and sometimes shattering. Welcome. Thank you. So what motivated you to write the book? Well, I first went to the Arab world as a uh, stringer for the New York Times. And so like, like all journalists, like most journalists in the, in the region, um, my day-to-day my -day work was, was focused on, on stories of, of crisis. Um, for the most part. Um, crisis dominates our, our coverage of the, of the region and probably will, will continue to um, for the foreseeable future. Um, and I came to feel that there was a lot about the reality as it was lived that was being lost, that, there, that, that these, this um, focus on crisis maybe had a distorting effect on our perception of the region. And I felt that that was particularly true when it came to women. Um, and so the book started really as, as um, these kind of back of the notebook jottings, of observations, things that hadn't found their way into um, the work I was doing for the Times. And, and um, I. Yeah. And here it is. Here it is. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I was doing a little research. I was interested to find out that there are actually 22 Arab countries. I had no idea there were so yes. many basically stretching across northern Africa and over into the Middle East. Yes. What makes a country an Arab country? Is it that people share a certain ethnicity, uh, a certain language? Are they all predominantly Muslim? Uh, well, they are predominantly Muslim and, and predominantly Arabic speaking, but there are um, there's a lot, an enormous amount of variation, as, as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of ethnicity? In, in, in terms of ethnicity. Okay. Uh, well, the you know, people, uh, there's a lot of debate about, about the term Arab um, as an ethnicity um, and who identifies as an Arab and who, who doesn't. Mm -hmm. The stories in your book are about women in, specifically in five Arab countries, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, which of these countries, if we had on a scale, uh, if we had to place the the, uh, the country, show that which countries are the most restrictive of the women, and which in the ones in which the women have the most freedom, what what would that look like? Well, it, it's a it's a tricky question because well, of course, so Saudi Arabia, of course, is at one end of the scale in terms of most restrictive, um, but um, in general, within the countries, your your, the degree of, of freedom that a woman has depends very much on, on the family the woman comes from, um, the, the community she's from, the, the, you know, what part of the country she's from. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you know, even in Saudi Arabia, even you know, in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, the, the Gulf countries are generally speaking um, the, the most restrictive mm -hmm. um, for women. Um, even within those countries, it, there's a lot of, a lot of personal variation. variation. Okay. Yes. The restrictions on Arab women, and that's what we tend to think about, focus mm -hmm. on when we, when we think about Arab women, seem to center almost exclusively on controlling their sexual behavior. Why is there so much focus on that? And is there any basis for that in Islamic law, or does it come from someplace else? Well, um, again, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated question. I, I, think that, um, I think that many religions place uh, restrictions on, on women and, and, and their sexual behavior, um, specifically, as, as you asked. Uh, I think that there's a, you know, I want to be, I want to be a bit careful here, but, but I think, I think that, um, Islamic law tends to be, tends to be very specific in, in the, in the duties that, um, 
and the and, you know and the responsibilities and the rights it accords to men and women and um, they're they're very different mm -hmm. and um, many of the women that I met argued argued to me that um, they they don't specifically restrict restrict women they restrict men as well um, but you know in contemporary life. Um, you know, when compared against the rights that Western women enjoy, that we enjoy here in the United States, it, it, it's the it's the women's situation that really that really stands out. Right. You did say that some of this uh, emphasis on controlling women's sexuality goes back to pre-Islam, to yes. the time when you're dealing with Arabic nomadic tribes. That, that goes back to yes. that time. Yes. And there's always a lot of debate about this when you when you talk about these rules, whether these are really it, from you know Islam, or, or are they are they cultural? Right. right. And you know in, in Syria and Lebanon, um, which are very very diverse religiously speaking, um, you you often find Christian women or women Druze women who are, uh, you know religion the, the religions are different, um, but they um, they're subject to many of the same rules within right. their communities. Right. Now, you were raised as a Jehovah's Witness. Yes. Um, are there parallels between the treatment of women in Arab countries and the treatment of women in the Jehovah's Witnesses? I, I found myself, um, you know, identifying with the, with the young women that I met very, very closely. You know, uh, you know in the, the Witnesses, um, for example, you're, you're taught that a, a woman should be in subjection to her husband, that the husband is the head of the household. You're um, both men and women. There, there's an emphasis on, on personal modesty of dress and, and, and behavior. Um, uh, on you know virginity, unto marriage, on only marrying once, um, you can't in fact get divorced. Right. right. Um, so there were there were certain things that I thought uh, that, that that felt like commonalities to mm -hmm. me. And um, I think you you find some of that in Orthodox Judaism as well. Yes, you do. Yeah. You know the the modesty of, of dress, the wigs, you know the uh, a ban on mixing of sexes. You exactly. find that. Yeah. Um, you often hear Arab women complain that Westerners uh, have this obsessive fixation on the veil yes. uh, and on the abaya, the, uh, the t which is the total body covering. Mm -hmm. um, do most women in the, in, and we're talking about the five countries that you're writing about, mm -hmm. do the majority of women in those countries wear the veil and the burqa or does it well, in, in Saudi Arabia, everyone does. Everyone uh, does. You, and, and as a Western woman working there or traveling there, you, you have to as well. Mm -hmm. You wear the full length of ayah and, right. and you wear the, um, you know, the black um, scarf that covers your hair. Um, in, in the Gulf countries, women, women um, you know, pretty much 100% of, of local women um, wear, wear uh, both. Right. Um, in, in, as you move, um, as you, as you move further west um, in Syria and Lebanon, it's it's um, you know it it it, it's it varies by by community by fa right. by family. Right. Um, but I, I would say healthy majority, even in Syria, Lebanon, um, and Saudi Arabia, among among the Muslim populations, do. Okay. Yeah. What was it like wearing the veil and the abaya? Uh, well, I, I only d did in Saudi Arabia, and I and I suppose I, I did as well. Um, in Iraq, um, sometimes just for, for safety, um, to be honest. Uh, but I, um, I felt very clumsy in it, actually. I, I think when you're not used to this extra, um, you know, it's floor length and, and you know, you're not used to this extra uh, layer, you, you can kind of get caught up in it mm -hmm. or it always gets caught in your car door or it, it blows in the wind <laughs> inconveniently. Um, but I, I also sort of started to, to like it, you know, in, in a way, you know, you, you have, uh, you know, this thing, uh, you know, imagine you have something that ensures that you're always perfectly appropriately dressed for every occasion. You never have to worry about your, you know, I don't mean to make light of it, but, but you don't have to worry about your, you know, your blouse coming untucked at the back right. or, Anything matching, um, it, it can actually <laughs> sort of streamline things mm -hmm. or make things a little little uh, easier in some ways. But so, you didn't feel imprisoned or any of that. I mean, I think it would be um, it would be a little you know strange for me to say that. I mean, I, I was going as a journalist. Right. I had chosen to go. I had sought out the assignments that taught right. me there. So, so I think it would it would be a little disingenuous if I if I 
you know, talked about feeling oppressed. Right. You, there, I, I, I could always choose to leave. Right. But, but you know, many of the women that I, that I spoke to did, did feel oppressed by it, for sure. Um, Syria is, is a terribly war-ravaged country at the moment yes. from which citizens are fleeing daily. But in the Syria you write about, yes. and I guess it was before what's going on now, uh, attempts to overthrow uh, Assad, the people are friendly, the yes. young women are pursuing college and university degrees. They seem content to have their parents choose their husbands, uh, are horrified at the idea of social mingling with the sexes. They seem happy with the status quo. Well, um, I, don't, I don't know if they were happy with the status quo, quo politically, and it was very difficult to engage them on that, on that subject. On political issues. On political okay. issues. I think, I think the, the Assad with, regime so on, was very, very repressive. Okay. But on social on, on social warnings. issues, um, you know, Syria was was a lot, you know, is a lot more diverse in terms of um, you know social social practice than than um, than Saudi Arabia, say, or or the or the Emirates. Um, but but yes, I, I met I met you know most of the most of the young women I met there and and everywhere, in fact, were were. Um, we're quite defensive, I think, of, of their society. And mm -hmm. I think that, that we look at the region and see this picture of almost monolithic oppression. And I think that they're, they're very aware of that. They, they know much more about us than we know about them, mm -hmm. by and large. They have, they have American TV, American movies. They, um, and there is a sense that, um, you know, you, you Americans look, look at us and think, you know, we must all just want to, to overthrow this whole, um, this whole system. And, and we don't. And we don't. Okay. And we're part of it. And we have, you know, a diversity of opinions that are just not mm -hmm. being seen. Uh, as I said before, uh, the young women that you were talking to in Syria who were m m in college and university, I mean, that astonished me. And you did write that there are more women in the Arab world who are getting college and university degrees uh, than men. Yes. So... What are these young women going to do with these college and university degrees, given that the majority of women in the Arab world don't work, right? Well, it's a huge problem, actually. I think an unemployment is very high across the region, and it's especially high for women. And in fact, um, they're not unrelated, I think, whereas a young man um, may have a job, you know, unemployment is high for men as well, but he may have a, may, may have a job available to him. He may have things that he can do. Um, in the public sphere, for a young woman um, going to university or going to graduate school are, are, are really her, uh, in many of these communities, are really her, her only um, path to advancement. Mm -hmm. um, and I spoke to many women, I mean, this isn't the case for everyone, but, but who saw it as a way to delay marriage, for example. You know, if you aren't sure you want to, to you know, ha your family to arrange a marriage for you, or maybe you don't like, you know, the, the candidates that they're running by you, you can, you know, going to get your master's degree, but would they for even, example. But would they be able to get jobs? Would they have jobs offered to them if they get their degrees, women? Um, it, 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 there's a, you know, it differs a lot, but, you know, country to country, um, Situation to situation, but but in general, it's a huge problem find, uh, for these women, for many of these women, mm -hmm. finding jobs, and many of them end up, you know, leaving, finishing their master's degree, and you know, and getting and married not, and having children. Exactly. Yeah. And, and not finding employment, or at least not finding it straight away. But it doesn't seem as if their parents are trying to keep them from getting higher education. In some cases. No, 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 they're, they're not actually, and that is something that um, you know. If you look at, for example, Saudi Arabia, which built the first elementary schools for girls in um, in the 1960s, so it's, it's this is very, very recent memory, like the very first ones, and and this was so controversial that that the uh, the government had to send in the army um, in certain places to protect these schools from um, the mobs that right. were, were basically trying to uh, prevent their opening um, and, to, and to protect the girls who were going to school. And um, it was very controversial. Maybe people were very upset. But now um, elementary education is almost, is almost universal. And, and you have um, great numbers of women who are going to university going, and going to graduate school. In Saudi Arabia. And it is supported um, in general by the, it's seen as, it's, it's prestigious. In fact, your, your value on the marriage market increases if That's you. That's interesting. If you're. So they're, so they're progressive on the issue mm -hmm. of women's education, though not necessarily on some other things. Yes. Interesting. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with more with Catherine Zoff 
author of Excellent Daughters, The Secret Lives of the Young Women Who Are Transforming the Arab World. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Catherine Zoff, author of Excellent Daughters, The Secret Lives of the Young Women Who Are Transforming the Arab World. Let's just talk, go briefly about the, the social conditions, the difference in social conditions from women in the five different countries you write about. And I'm just gonna country to country, and we'll just briefly talk okay. about those. In Syria. Well, in Syria, again, it's, it's, it's difficult now to talk about it because, because of the, you know, the, the chaos. civil war there. It's hard to really know. Um, but um, the S Syria um, pre-war, you know, the Syria that, that I knew when I, when I lived there was, was really among the most open uh, countries for women. And I think, you know, in part, this is, um, this is thanks to the, you know, the, Bath the Baathist government. You know, this was true in Iraq as well. The, the focus was on um, it's a truly, equality. It's a yeah, yeah, it's a it's socialist. A yeah. It's a socialist, secular-minded uh, government and, and um, very, you know, horrendously oppressive in, in, in many, many ways. But uh, for, for women, um, you know, they were, uh, you know, when, when you look at, at women's rights, that, you know, women were um, asked not to wear the veil in school, for example, and that was something that um, many families, um, you know, sort of resented. Mm -hmm. But it also meant that girls had this, you know, the safe space, a place where, you know, that the their um, they had a longer period of of, of freedom and a, a place, you know, a place where where they could, you know, just go and and pursue their, you know, their their goals. Um, is you know, that still true? They don't wear the veils. In, uh, it is. School? It is no longer true. Okay. In fact, but uh, but it was true for for uh, I think about thirty years. Okay. In fact, why did it come back? Why um, it was it was pr there was a lot of pressure I think and and it was something that um, it was done um, within the last decade. It was in two thousand maybe two thousand six or, or two thousand seven. Okay. Uh, I would have to check, but but it was um, it was. An attempt, I think, by the Assad government to sort of appease the uh, the religious conservatives. Okay. Now, Lebanon, uh, I was surprised to learn it is the playground of the Arab world, uh, where you actually have Arab women hanging out in bars and dancing on bar tops. Um, women, while technically protecting their virginity, but engaging in oral and anal sex. Um, hymenoplasty is a popular form of surgery for women who have sexually strayed but want to be virgins again when they get married. Now these don't sound like the Arab women we think we know. What's no, happening in Lebanon? No, I mean Lebanon is a very particular case, I think. But the but I but yes, I mean I interview I had some fascinating interviews with gynecologists there actually, um, who who um, talked about it talked more openly about the sexual culture than than um, than, than I was usually able to get in mm -hmm. in um, in interview you know in interviews. Uh, but um, that they talked about how, um, when it came down to it, when when a girl was going to get married, um, they al always recommended uh, hymenoplasty. Uh, they, they they had seen so many marriages fall apart instantly when it was discovered that the woman was no longer a virgin. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you know, I, I spoke to one gynecologist who I describe in the book who who talked about it almost as a, you know. A, he had a kind of feminist argument for okay. hymenoplasty, if you can, if you can. So how did Lebanon get to be so wild and crazy? How did that happen? Well, I think there's a, you know, it's had a long tradition. It's a, you know, it's a Mediterranean country. It's a, it's a, you know, Mediterranean society. They have, they have the beaches, they have the mountains. It's, it, for, for a long, long time, it's been the place where people came from around the region to, for their vacations. And so, um, I think you know it, it, it's had that that diversity. It's had you know people coming in and, and thinking of Lebanon as a place to let down their hair, right. I see. and that culture has um, is is very very visible. It's you know there, um, but they're also very very conservative communities in Lebanon. Okay. So it just an interesting. I'm going to skip over Egypt okay. for the moment, but Saudi Arabia, where Islam infuses every aspect of daily life, and, and which is the most restrictive in its treatment of women. I think I saw a movie some years ago that was a, about the, um, 
the religious police, how do you pronounce it, the Hai? The, the Hai'a. The yeah. Hai'a. And th this was a movie just followed these women who are followed around by the religious police and, you know, harassed, uh, sometimes beaten if their skirts, you know, if they're yes. showing too much, if they're dressing immodestly. And, and at the end, all the, the women end up in jail. Um, uh, in Saudi Arabia, women are not allowed to drive. They can't travel uh, without the consent of a male guardian. All women are under male guardianship. Yes. Um, yes. So... <laughs> <laughs> So, what were you hearing from the women in Saudi Arabia? Well, you know, of course, there are, there are many women there who are, um, you know, who are incensed by this and who, who would like to see it, you know, change instantly. Um, the, the greater surprise to me was the number of women, I would say the majority, who defend it, who feel that this is their, um, this is Saudi culture, this is Saudi part of Saudi identity. Um, they're very devout, you know, women as like men are, are tend to be very, very devout. Um, and I met many teenage girls, you know, I described this in the book, talking to teenage girls who, we were in a mall, which is one of the areas where the religious police are, you know, sort of always patrolling and on the lookout and making sure you're, you know, you don't have a lock of hair escaping from your scarf. And they felt that they were um, the guardians of sort of normal Saudi values and, and that they were, they, they felt that they were protectors. Um, certainly not all women feel that way, but there is a sort of instinctive defense of these things, mm -hmm. okay. I think. Um, now, in the United Arab Emirates, uh, I gather there's a much more liberal climate there. Uh, and uh, one of the, the young women you talked about, she had left, I think, Syria to come work mm -hmm. for, the, yes. for the airlines that was based there. Do the women, and so the airline, the flight attendants, they don't wear, obviously don't wear the, the veil. No, and the no, some of them, you know, they, they will have a little thing on the, on the hat that looks a little a bit like a veil. A veil, Kind right. of a token veil. Right, yeah. right. Um, but... This is a place where, you know, women come from some of the other more restrictive mm -hmm. uh, Arab countries and get more of a taste of freedom. Mm -hmm. it, it is, actually. I, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I think because these countries are, are the economic powerhouses that they are and, and, and there's so much growth uh, there, um, you know, for over a generation, uh, young men have been going from the other Arab countries and, and working and, you know, working for a while in Saudi Arabia or in Dubai or in Abu Dhabi. Um, and uh, the women are starting to go too. And their, their numbers are smaller and there are still many families that, that don't want to send a daughter, you know, over to, to work. But, um, but increasing numbers are. And, and they described... Um, you know, I, I heard a lot about how um, working in the Gulf changes men and women differently. Mm -hmm. You know, an Egyptian man and an Egyptian woman who go work in the Gulf, you know, stereotypically. Does a man become more conservative? Yes. How that's did what I they know found. that? Yes, the man becomes more conservative. <laughs> he goes home. He wants a wife who, who veils properly, who, yeah, and the women tend to see it to... to you know, to, it's, it's the reverse, basically. So they have a hard adjustment going hard, back home. They have a really hard adjustment going back. They go back and they're, you know in their house and, and they're, they're treated like a, like a, you know, a teenage daughter again and, and it's very, very difficult for many of them. To what extent have events like the Arab Spring uprising, the overthrow of President Mubarak in Egypt, the civil war in Syria created more women activists, more activism among women? We're seeing a lot more women um, activists and, and a lot more women um, a lot more political engagement, I think. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's hard to say whether it's, you know, the Arab Spring has certainly had an effect, but also I think social media, having a place that, a, a safe place to express opinions. And connect with other And to connect with others, women. yes, exactly. You may, you know, uh, previously, you know, it was just about your community and whom you happen to know. And if you privately had an opinion, you might not know anyone who shared it. And, and now you can, you can meet those people. So what changes have there been in the lives of women in the Arab countries? It sounds as if they have been minimal and rather spotty. Well, again, so, so I think, uh, you know, as I wrote in the book, I, I, I'm you know, I tried to make the case for for small gestures, for small acts of courage, and how those can be um, very profound and, and actually have have pretty far-reaching effects. Um, if you're looking at at you know change in the Arab world, uh, broad strokes, 
you know, it, it, it's hard to say. Um, the Arab Spring, um, there was, you know, there were, there were these, um, you know, wonderful images of, of women and men, you know, on Tahrir Square, you know, waving banners together. But then afterwards, there afterward, was a, a backlash, yes, a pushback. There was a, there was a backlash. Um, so you talk about small gestures. Give me, give me an example of uh, well, a small gesture that has changed, started to change. Well, I'll give an example of, of one that I um, I had originally not I, I had I had not expected this to be very meaningful. I think um, I I went um, the New Yorker actually sent me to Saudi Arabia in 2013 to report on women starting to work in lingerie shops and makeup shops and and other um, other sorts of stores that mainly serve women and. Um, so it's a it's a population of 28 million. It's a very large uh, large country. But all the lingerie shops were staffed by men. They had been staffed by men right. who were um, who were migrant workers, men from uh, from developing countries, usually on on short term contracts. But um, but so you're only talking about really a few thousand women, you know, who are who are entering these jobs, or at least at the time that I, you know, there are probably you know there are more now. Because but, there was there was a push to. There was actually a movement, you know, yes. that women should have these jobs. And well, and the interesting thing was that the that the movement, the activists who organized this movement, um, pitched themselves to social conservatives. They said, "Well, this is shaming for a woman. A, a good, modest Saudi lady shouldn't have to buy her underpants from a you know from a male clerk. Women should should hold these jobs." And it was it was actually very clever, and it was very well pitched to um, the social values. And so um, the uh, labor ministry changed the rules and uh, allowed women to hold the jobs, these jobs. And because it's not, um, it's still not, you know, considered socially acceptable for a woman to work in, a, in a, the public space, the first women to hold the jobs tended, you know, by and large to be on the outside of society in some mm -hmm. way. There were widows, divorcees, or women who had not been able to get married or, you know, families in financial difficulties. And, but you know, it was I, an inroad. It was an inroad. And I, but I met these women and so many of them told me I had just been at home since my divorce. I had, was sent back to my family's home. I'd never met another divorced woman. I never knew that it was possible to have my children come to see me. And now I have a little bit of money and they their father that. knows that I can hire a lawyer. You the know, lawyer, it's a big thing. It was a huge thing. And yeah. they were sharing information. Right. It, it, you know, it felt like there was this emerging kind of class consciousness. Right. right. We're out of time. I, I have to um, admit that I found the story of women in the Arab countries. It's, it's, it's very complicated. It is. It, it's very complicated. But I think um, one of the merits of your book is that you point out that it's not simple. And it's not necessarily black and white the way many Americans think of it. It is a very nuanced and complicated thing. Well, thank you. So, thank you very much. And I want to thank you, uh, Catherine Zoff, for joining me today. Excellent Daughters, The Secret Lives of the Young Women Who Are Transforming the Arab World has just been published by the Penguin Press for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.